Uh, Reese Stewart, good to see you. Can I see you again? Yeah, I'm here. Hey. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm not bad at all. All right. So Reese will be talking to us about analyzing historical hurricane prediction accuracy using PostGIS. Checking out the predictions. Are the, are the predictions right? So uh, yeah, fire up your, uh, fire up your screen share and, uh, and walk us through this, uh, this analysis. I'm looking forward to it. All righty. Can you all uh, see my screen? We're online. Yep, there we go. We're online. Um, we're seeing the agenda right now. All right. Um, there was a small error on the agenda on the uh, website for post just today. The title was a little bit inaccurate. All right. Um, the, ac the actual title should be not this, but I'm going to change it just briefly All right. for my purposes to hurricane prediction accuracy analysis using the PRAM stack. So, yeah. Okay. That's more like it. All right, so hurricane prediction accuracy analysis using the PRAM stack. I am Reese. I am an infrequent code contributor and a more infrequent tweeter, but I am on the, the interwebs in some way, shape, or form as at Reese Alistair. I am one third of a small company based in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, we do spatial data analysis, mainly for small and medium-sized businesses that don't know they have a wealth of data, a wealth of spatial data. Well, that has been our bread and butter. We are adding some jam and marmalade in the form of a power delivery modeling software as a service, which is running on top of the PRAM stack, as well as using PG routing. It should be entering the beta phase next month. So if anybody is interested in power delivery modeling, you can give me a call. All right, so a brief agenda for this talk. We're gonna be speaking about hurricanes, uh, the PRAM stack, and then there will be code, a lot of code, really, maybe too much code, um, so you're warned. All righty, hurricanes, what are they? Hurricanes are rapidly rotating storm systems. They have low pressure centers, closed atmospheric circulation, strong winds, and a spiral arrangement of thunderstorms that produce heavy rain and or squalls. It's very technical jargon right there. Very, very technical meteorological speak. So let's break it down. The TLDR, think strong winds, torrential rain, and coastal flooding, and really lots of infrastructure damage, uh, a lot of infrastructure damage. These are images from the Northern Bahamas. Uh, this was after Hurricane Dorian impacted there in 2019. You can see the devastation is quite complete. Um, so this is a global map of all hurricane tracks from 1985 to 2005. And the hurricanes are called hurricanes in this part of the world. Folks in Australia and the Western Pacific call them cyclones and folks near to Japan and the Northern Pacific call them typhoons. But really they're all the same phenomena. All right, prediction and forecasting. So there's a hurricane season and in the Atlantic basin, it runs from the first day of June to the last day of November. So that means we're technically still in the hurricane season right now and there are 12 days left. 
18 and 12, 30. Yeah, 12 days left. Uh, the body that deals with forecasting in the Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific is the National Hurricane Center out of Miami, Florida. They, they offer a number of products in terms of forecasting, graphical outlooks, textual data, and uh, this is one of them that I want to focus on. So <clears throat> this is a five-day forecast. The box in the bottom left basically gives the current time and date of the advisory and the name or number of the storm. This box contains the current weather information. So location, current speeds, and direction of travel. And then over here is a graphical uh, path of the forecast. The mustard yellowish orange dot is the actual location. And then the black dots with the letters inside them are the forecast periods. So these are at 12 hour intervals. The letter inside the dot indicates the predicted strength of the uh, system. So D is for a tropical depression. S is for a tropical storm. H is for a hurricane. And hurricanes start at about 120 kph upwards. And M are for major hurricanes. Major hurricanes are hurricanes that are either category three, four, or five. And for reference, category five hurricanes have sustained wind speeds in excess of 250 kilometers per hour. Pretty, pretty fast. All right, so it's obvious why hurricanes are to be avoided and why the prediction is, is important. If you can know where a hurricane is going to be, you can mitigate, you can prepare, and if possible, evacuate. All right, that's hurricanes. Time for the pram stack. Uh, but first, what is a stack? So think of a stack as different sets of software that are used together for one purpose. Um, popular examples are the LAMP stack. This is from early 2000s, very, very popular. Linux, Apache, MySQL, and uh, PHP, or Perl, or Python. Uh, popular in the last five years to a decade is the mean stack. That's MongoDB, ExpressJS, Angular, and Node. Then there is T-Rex, which is Terminus DB, React.js, and Express. And uber popular nowadays is the Jamstack, JavaScript, APIs, and the markup. So what is the Pram Stack? Well, the Pram Stack is PostGIS, OGR FDW, and HTTP. So these are all PostgreSQL extensions written primarily by the same person. I leave it up to the intrepid audience member to figure out what PRAM stands for. All right, so that's hurricanes done and the PRAM stack done. It's time for code. And I do mean a lot of code, maybe too much code. Yeah, code can done. Um, but first, a small interjection. This is a meteorologist. I am not one of them. This entire undertaking of determining the accuracy of the hurricane forecast is tremendously unscientific, uh, as is evidenced by me finding a gif of Bill Murray blowing a storm on a screen. So it's not to be taken too seriously. It's more a demonstration of the goodness you can find in PostGIS and the ecosystem around it. Alrighty, back to code. So we're going to install the Pram stack first. So we want to install PostGIS, OGR, FDW, and HTTP. 
uh, small aside. The data we're going to be using is located on the NHC website in several thousand zip files. Each file contains about three or four shape files. Um, these shape files have the forecast data in them. So the first part of this uh, highly unscientific endeavor is going to be a giant web scraping exercise. All right, having said that, I want to try and accomplish everything in one call to the database. Uh, so to that end, I'm going to use an anonymous code block. It's pretty straightforward. There is a part to declare, a begin, and an end. All right, let's jump into it. So I'm going to declare some variables that I think I may need. Then I like namespaces a lot. Namespaces are good. So create schemas to store your data. Um, I mentioned earlier that there are several thousand files I need to, con need to look at. So this is a loop. And the first member of the prompt stack makes an appearance right here. So this is HTTP. It's effectively a wrapper around curl. Um, you can use all the HTTP verbs, get, put, delete, post. Um, in this case, we're using a simple get request. Uh, there are a whole host of function of options rather that you can use. So we can set timeouts, you can do proxies, anything curl can do, you can effectively do right here. Alrighty, I'm gonna use the syntactic sugar that is a CTE to make life easier and make it look good. And we're basically gonna dump the contents of our get request into some standard PostgreSQL functions to split the HTML page, split the page into different rows, and then use some regular expression matching to get the zip file name. And finally, we'll just print it to the console to see if we're on the right track. All right. And it works, what do you know? Um, when you see the do, that means the uh, anonymous code block worked well. Okay, so we wanna we wanna actually dive in to the zip files and have a look at them. So first step is doing this. This is where the second part of the pram stack makes an appearance. This is OGR FDW. Regina Obi touched on it earlier in the prior talk. Um, I won't dive deep in it either, but suffice it to say, OGR FDW allows you to access or examine data external to PostgreSQL from within PostgreSQL. Lines 20 through 24 are the creation of the server, which is what the external resource is called in uh, FDW parlance. I will point out something that is super cool. Uh, you have what are called virtual file systems. So OGR FDW can access data in compressed files or data on the web, or in this case, compressed data on the web without having to do a pre-download. That's fantastic. Uh, so once we have created our server, we're gonna need to access the data on the server. Uh, normally we would know, we would now have to go ahead and create each or define each table in the foreign server manually. But there is a lovely thing called import foreign schema, which will inspect the external resource and define all the tables for you. Really, really good. All righty. Uh, this next bit is plain old PLP GSQL. 
nothing fancy here. Um, I need to know the table name in the zip file. So that is done here in these two lines. And then I want to create a table to store the data from the zip file. So if this is the first iteration of the loop, then I'll create a table. Otherwise, I'll just insert it into the table since it would have been created already. And finally, we drop the server since it's no longer needed. All right, with that, we're off to the races. We're halfway there, I promise you. Except we're not. So apparently, <laughs> all archive files aren't created equally. So the good old folks at the National Hurricane Center decided to add columns over time to their shape files. So this kind of um, messed stuff up. Not to be deterred, PostgreSQL has a nifty, nifty type to deal with this exact thing. Enter JSON. So we can now use to JSON to basically agglomerate all the table data, all the columns into one column called the bulk. All right, we're good again. We are good. Except we're not good. So I, I can really understand adding columns over time, right? What I can't understand is changing the name of the files in the zip file. That just didn't make any sense. Like, surely you can't be serious. No. All right, we move forward. To fix this, we're gonna change these two lines to this one line. Um, we're gonna just try and find the table name from PG catalog. Hopefully, hopefully, only one table has PTS in the name. All right, ready again. And another hiccup. This time I was 23 minutes in. It's a lot of data to download. So what happened here? Well, sometimes the internet just doesn't work. A stray cosmic ray, packets go missing, or maybe the actual file is really corrupt. So I had to add some uh, error handling into this situation. I won't dive too deep into it. But I did, however, make some other changes in the entire anonymous code block. So firstly, I realized some columns in the zip files were common. So I pulled those out and left the JSON B bulk, uh, bulk column there. For some reason, I wanted the year in a column by itself. So I pulled it out of the table name or the file name rather. Um, I condensed the CTE into a one-liner. Well, I removed the CTE actually. There's no one-liner. And the error handling code lives right here. I also added a line to, what did I add a line for? I added a line to draw any dodgy files into a table, which I created here. Okay, so we're definitely good. All right. So it worked. It took two hours, but it worked. So I, I ran this about three or four times from several locations. And the fastest it went through was an hour and 15 minutes. It is obviously highly dependent on your internet speeds. All right. So we have the data. It's no time to try and determine the accuracy. Uh, this is what the data looks like. Um, all these orange dots are forecast positions and actual positions. So let's start out by adding another CTE block and uh, we're gonna get some columns we want. We want the year column, advisory number, storm number, and these last three columns are, were in the bulk field, uh, storm name, Tau, 
I could not find what TAU meant or TAU meant on the NHC's website, but effectively that is pointing to the forecast period. And then basin is the ocean basin it's in, either the Atlantic or the Eastern Pacific. The NHC never fails, never fails to amaze me. This entire obnoxious piece of code, this large ginormous case statement is there because the NHC refuses to use regular timestamps and instead, instead has chosen to use three different types of timestamps over the past decade or two. Very annoying. This uh, is giving me the advisory time, meaning the time the forecast was published. And similarly, I wanted the actual forecast time, another ginormous and obnoxious case statement. And I'm just adding the forecast period, which is the TAU column to get the forecast time. And then uh, the data comes over from OGR FEW as uh, geometry, but it's our Latlang stuff. It's global data or, you know, half global. So I'm converting it to a geography type. And for some reason, PostgreSQL doesn't understand this time zone. So I ignored it. Um, there weren't many of them, maybe like 10 or 20 out of the 39,000 rows. Um, and then finally, we're doing some ordering just to make things in order, I guess. All right, so that looks like this. From left to right, year, advisory number, storm number, name, if it has one, tau or TAU, basin, advisory time, which is the time the advisor has put out, forecast time, the forecast time, and the geography. All right, we're now really halfway there. I promise you no more errors, I hope. All righty. Um, <laughs> so to, let's look at one storm in particular. We're gonna focus on what became Hurricane Sam this year. So let's switch this line to this line. Hurricane Sam was the 18th storm of 2021, 2021 in the Atlantic Basin. To determine the accuracy, we just need to compare the locations of the storm at a given time. So a self-join is in order. So we'll extend our CTE and we'll drop in the columns we want to see. The third part, our third member of the PRAM stack makes a full appearance here. That is with the ST distance function. So we're gonna basically measure the distance from the forecast position at a given time to the actual position at a given time. Um, this is our self-join. I'm only looking at actual times on one side of the join. Hence, we're setting TAU to zero. And uh, that's what you get. So this might look a little bit confusing. So let's understand what this is. What I'm saying is that at this time, which is the 9 a.m. Zulu, on the 23rd of December, the hurricane or storm was 62 kilometers away from where I said it would have been 12 hours ago. Pretty straightforward, kind of. All right, so a visualization might be useful. Uh, so this is a plot over time of what became Hurricane Sam. Uh, the orange dot is the actual location at, at any given time. And the dots around it are the forecasted locations that were forecasted previously. 
All right, so we are pretty much there. Um, so we're gonna just select from that CTE and we can get uh, average, sorry, an average of the forecasting for each time period. So we use the group by, and that looks like this. So basically we are saying for Hurricane Sam, every 12 hour forecasts, on average, the location was 94 kilometers away from where it would have been, or where we said it would have been. Similarly, you can see that there are numbers for 24, 36, and 48 hours. It should come as no surprise that the longer the forecast period, the larger the distance is. Um, we could, of course, go to town and start doing this, not just for one storm, but for the entire data set. Or we could do it based on year, or do it based on basin or month, the possibilities are endless. I did say that I wanted to get everything done in one, in one call to the database. And I haven't put any data out as yet. Um, we could get very exotic and use OG or FDW to push out to a supported store or a WFS or to get fancy with HTTP and call an API and push data up that way. But I'm gonna keep it simple and use PostgreSQL's copy command to just dump a CSV to my local disk. That's what this is here in lines 53 and 91. And there you go. So that is how you can determine <laughs> With, with some level of unscientific city, if that is a word, uh, how accurate hurricanes are and the predictions around them are rather. So mission accomplished. I am finished. Well, that was fabulous. I've uh, I've never seen such a wonderful collection of. Uh, with crazy tools all jammed together and in pursuit of actually coming up with a real analytical result at the end of the day. I and mean, you slurped in a lot of data. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, just kind of went straight into the database. So uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a very, very cool example. Um, I got one question uh, here from Tom T. Uh, Reese, what, uh, what client is it that we see in the presentation? Um, Vim or something else? I guess he's a- uh, Oh no, um, that is, PSPG. PSPG. Yeah. Oh, okay. PostgreSQL really pager. Cool. So what does it what does it what does it do? It gives you uh, those beautiful tables. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll have to get my hands on that. Um, I wanted to ask you. Um, so, have you? This is a cool example. Have you used these crazy tools for uh, for live and production stuff? Um, <laughs> so that is OGR FDW yes. yeah. in production. I had mentioned earlier that I'm pushing into beta a uh, software as a service come December, mm -hmm. and that makes heavy use of OGR FDW. Okay. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for giving that uh, for giving that talk and showing off those tools. Uh, someone's got to do it. I appreciate that you did it. <laughs> Um, so that was that was a really really neat talk.